Hello, everyone. Hello to our gems. We are live, and I saw the the amount of gems that were here with us tonight, hidden gems. I can't believe it. We have Australia, Los Angeles, Minnesota, Prince Edward Island, Brisbane. So good to see everyone. Hello, Minnesota. Uh, we have a very special show uh, for all of you tonight. And I think many of you realize that we, we are starting with a large group of people tonight. Forgive us for being a little bit late. We have Murphy's law. That's what John called today. Murphy's law are, uh, should we tell everyone <laughs> I showered? So I showered today at my in-laws house because our, uh, we had a flood in our house, uh, a rather, uh, large flood. It's still flooding. We've got some buckets and our water's turned off. I ran to go shower somewhere else. And then our podcast episodes, um, our entire catalog of podcasts, except for about six, all disappeared. Uh, we're working on resolving that. <laughs> we have a little right. bit those more hope. Those aren't related, by the way. I don't think the flood. What'd you say? I, those two aren't related. The flood did not lead to the to the no. the podcast episodes. It's just No, none of these are related. And then as we were um very stressed out about those two things uh our child had his own little trauma um his tablet broke <laughs> which might not be that big a deal to many of you but when you're five it's a really big deal um, that was that was a much bigger deal than the flood so <laughs> right. him, you could yeah. have cared less about our house flooding he was like yeah. wow look at all this water but when his tablet broke um he dropped it and it shattered he was not happy but we're here and we are here ready to talk uh the idaho for moscow idaho university of idaho case uh this is a case that john you and i have been covering from the very beginning uh but of course uh then i rushed off to idaho for a different case the lori vallow daybell case which i will be going back for uh for the sentencing at the end of this month and here we are though uh, we, we have been, we have not stopped talking about this case. Um, the crime for those, uh, unfamiliar with this case, although that's hard for me to imagine, but here, here it goes uh, on, on November 13th, uh, the most tragic thing happened in the small college town of Moscow, Idaho, and three roommates and a boyfriend, Ethan. Ethan, Zana, Maddie, and Kaylee were uh, brutally stabbed to death in the middle of the night uh, in, a, in a town that rarely sees crime. And uh, for a very long time, nobody, there were no suspects for a very, very long time. Uh, we covered it from the very beginning. You profiled who you thought might commit such a crime, John. John is a forensic psychologist. He evaluates criminals for a living. And so we did a lot of speculating on what type of person could do such a thing. Well, we journeyed with all of you, our hidden gems, even appearing on Dateline with all of you when we learned that Brian Koberger was arrested um, and charged in the murders of these four young people. That is where we are now. And uh, Debbie, thank you so much. I appreciate that so much, Debbie. Um, thank you. I believe, Debbie, you are from Idaho, I think, possibly. Thank you for being here tonight. So we have been, uh, John, maybe at this point, you should share about what you're going to talk about specifically tonight. Of course, many there are many different directions we could go, but why don't you tell people where we're going to continue Yeah, going so I think we'll, we'll, we'll revisit some of the old information and get people up to date. And then we have new information related to some of his mother's posts on social media. We have some information from friends that have spoken out since the, the crimes were committed. We have more information about his firing from Washington State as a TA. And how, I think that, that plays a huge role in this crime that we didn't really we haven't talked about since we covered it last. So we'll, we'll put together some new pieces, I think, and present some new ideas and, and hopefully we'll, in that sense, we'll continue to illuminate 
Brian Kohlberger's psychological portrait or um, his his psychological state of mind. Hey, John, I am ref I am hearing from a couple people that your mic is weird. And honestly, it actually sounded a little weird to me, but I chalked it up to it being my computer. Oh, I wonder yeah, if your mic went I out. Was, I was in such a hurry that I didn't plug. I'm sorry. I didn't let me. I didn't plug in my mic. So let me let me see if I can. Do Guys, that. flood. There was a flood, <laughs> yeah. and we lost all of our. We lost I, all of our. We lost all of our um, episodes. I think we're gonna find them. Luckily, I think we found our episodes. But, but. Mike is in. Is that is that better? Let's see. Better? Talk again. Is that better? Yes, that is a lot better. I want to thank those of you that let me know. I just, again, I chalked it up to it being my computer. My speaker's been going out. So thank you to those who uh, made it so John sounds better. Dr. Babe, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, I totally, I, I was able to get the lighting up. I just, I don't, the most important thing, the mic, I forgot. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Part of me, yeah. part of me. Is those, still, those, that ne those that didn't notice that your sound was bad are now like, oh, no, now it's really nice. So there you go. <laughs> to a okay. So, yeah, that's so here we are. So sound is better. That's good. All right. Go ahead. Continue. We could hear you. It just you sound better now. So I was just saying we're going to revisit some old information and we're going to bring in some new information specifically related to his mother and some family dynamics and some, some things his mother has said on social media and how that might be related to who Brian Kober is and his development. We're going to talk about the information from his dismissal from Washington State as a TA. I think that's a really important part of this story. We probably, we didn't know about that at the time we last talked about Koberger. So we will discuss the importance of him losing his TA position, him being fired essentially, and how that contributed to, I think, to his, his actions, to the murder. So, and of course I've had time to, over the last few months to reflect more on it and to think more about it. And, and so I think this will just be an updated, psychological portrait of Brian Kohlberger based on what we know, based on as much information as we've been able to obtain. And of course it will change. You know, a lot of information has not been released, but we will amend things as we learn more. And I, would, I do want to give a big shout out to one of our gems, Julie Holden, for doing a tremendous amount of research and being extremely helpful. And Julie's amazing. We love Julie. She was really instrumental in developing a timeline and getting some really interesting research and sending us some interesting research. So thank you, Julie. Yes, thank you, Julie. Yeah, John and I were uh, having a meeting at our house. I guess you can call it a meeting. We were talking together about how we were going to put together our theory, and we called Julie on the phone and said, look, Julie, this is what we want to cover this is what we're thinking, but we need a timeline of this, this, and this, and what, and the information Julie is able to uncover is always really incredible and really thorough. So Julie, thank you. Um, I offered to buy her a little gift and she said, are you ready for this? She said, no, no, just put anything you were going to gift me to the Bellagio, put it for, to the Bellagio pool party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so we have, uh, we're going to start a little uh, account for Julie for her, her plane ticket and <laughs> her, her room. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll have a, a Bellagio slush fund. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I also want to share, I know that there are a lot of theories surrounding Brian Koberger when it comes to guilt or innocence. And I just want to share that today, uh, of course, um, as always, Brian Koberger is, innocent until proven guilty. But today we are going to, well, I just, what, what are we going to do? we we have a theory about what you shared already, but. Right. I don't, I don't think we're going to weigh in on guilt or innocence. I think no, there's some, that's what I'm trying to say. We're not weighing in on guilt or innocence, 
I think there's discuss Brian Coburn. There's some presumption that there's sufficient evidence to take it to court and you know to justify the charges. So that's for the moment that's good enough for us. You know, obviously the they can duke it out in court to decide whether he is guilty or not, and that's where that happens. So in that sense, this would be considered very much speculation, but it's speculation tied to concrete evidence and. There is a presupposition certainly underlying our, our interpretation or analysis, which is that the evidence does point to him and it certainly justifies charges against him. And so we're, we're, we're in agreement with that presupposition. Yes. All right. Um, and uh, we already have uh, over 2000 people on chat right now. Thank you for being here. If you could please like, this video and subscribe. Both of those things help us to grow and mean a lot to us. And thank you. Go ahead, babe. The floor uh, or the stream yard link is yours. <laughs> right. The, 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 the computer video is mine um, for the moment. Of course, please jump in. But so let, let's just recap some of the things we've talked about and, and some additional thoughts I might have. One interesting thing, so we didn't, we talked about the Tapa Talk forum where he talks about visual snow and he talks about some mental health issues there. And so I, I want to reiterate one of the points that we made there, which is that his, he talked about his depression and your, your mic is off. Go ahead. Okay. So let me let me start with a couple of elements of the Tapa talk that I think would be that are useful in understanding Brian Koberger from his childhood. And those would be what a friend described as his lifelong depression. So a close friend of Brian's said that Brian confided him that he had lifelong depression, which is depression, which is also something that he mentions in the Tapa Talk discussion. He also talks about anxiety a great deal in the Tapa Talk. So I think this, this combination of depression and anxiety is important in setting the stage. And, and apparently he has this depression and anxiety from a very early age. So the anxiety will become relevant, I think, because it seems likely that he develops some obsessive compulsive qualities later on. His diet is very obsessive compulsive like. I don't know if I would diagnose him with OCD, but he certainly seems to have some of those qualities. His exercise is very compulsive. There are certain things that he does that are repetitive. And so, so I think if you start with kind of this, this anxiety and depression and you see this as eventually, or maybe even early on, we haven't talked to enough family. We haven't talked to any family members yet. We'd love to, but, um, but it, it's possible to envision some type of obsessive compulsive type qualities developing at a fairly early age. And so I think that's going to be an important part of the story later. The other thing that's an important part of the story from his childhood is his weight. So he seems to have struggled with his weight from a very early age. And he seems to have been, according to a number of friends and, and childhood friends, he seems to have been bullied quite a bit. There was a lot of rejection in his childhood. But I, I think there's something else to that. I don't, I don't think it's just the weight that led to the bullying. I, I think we're now seeing that there's a very kind of socially inept quality to Brian Koberger. There's a woman who I won't mention her name, but she's, she's actually, she gave an interview, it's on video, she described a date with Brian Koberger in 2015-ish. He would have been around 19, 20, 21, 2016. The, the exact date is not clear, but he was a young adult or late teenager. And she talked about how he was persistent in wanting to walk her home. They went to a movie and he was really persistent in wanting to walk her home. And she agreed because she thought he was a little creepy. So she didn't want any conflict. So she agreed to have him come back with her. He went into the apartment and she said that he kept tickling her. He would like tickle her like a kid. And I mean, this is a 20 year old. And so he was persistent and, and she didn't know what to do. She thought this was really awkward. Like who, 
who tickles someone on a first date? I mean, they went to a movie, so they didn't even really interact. And they go to her apartment, and she's now engaged in this really bizarre tickling behavior. And so her story is that she doesn't know what to do. She's a little bit afraid of him. So she she says she has to go to the bathroom, and she feels sick, and she pretends to get sick in the bathroom, and he leaves because even that apparently was too much for him. So he didn't want to persist with the tickling because I think he – believed or believed based on what she was saying that 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 she was sick so he left and then an hour later she sends him a text or i'm sorry brian kohlberger sends her a text saying i think you have really quote and this is a quote according to her and we haven't vetted this but she says quote you have really good birthing hips so i mean that's weird that's Someone weird, that's been on right? a lot of that's, dates. That's weird. That's weird. So I and, and I use this as an example. This isn't just the only example, but this is this is an example, I think, of kind of this socially awkward presentation and this social ineptness that he's there's something peculiar about his social interactions. And some people have speculated that maybe he's on the autism spectrum. I don't, I I just I wouldn't know enough to go there. I I just simply don't have enough information to make that assessment. That's something that a forensic professional would have to do if they met with him in person, obviously, and did some testing. And I haven't been, I haven't clearly haven't done that, but, but so I think that the, the bullying is not just the weight. I think that he, he's, he's being subjected to some bullying because of the weight at some point, but I think it's also this awkward social presentation that he's there's stories of him going up to some females in the hallway and asking them on dates or he there's one story in particular where he walks up to a student like in sophomore year and he says to her let's hang out like they're best friends and he's never met her he's never talked to her so there's there, there's just this presumption that somehow people should instantly like him and that he's instantly likable and i mean he doesn't understand that social interactions take some work and you just don't right. come up to someone and say, Hey, let's date. You know, I think you're, I think, I think you're really cool. Let's date, let's hang out. Right. So there, there's something there that's, that's really socially peculiar. And I think it's those, it's that combination. It's the weight and the social awkwardness that's leading to the bullying. and it's not just the weight. I kind of speculated early on that a lot of his classmates were saying it was the weight. But I think it's more than that. So you have you have these elements. I think also it seems to me likely that there's probably some genetic issues here in terms of temperament, that it seems to me he's probably fairly sensitive, that he's probably a bit introverted. And again, I wouldn't be able to confirm that unless I did some testing. But But when you put those together, when you put together the introversion, the depression, the anxiety, maybe some qualities of obsessive compulsive disorder, you put together the the bullying with the rejection, the weight, the social awkwardness. I think you're really kind of setting the stage for potentially for mental health problems later on. Okay. So, so I think yeah. those are those are kind of the, the qualities that really stand out from his early childhood that that will play a you know a role in the story later on. So, so, but what we're, but what, but what you've put together though, so far as a map of, uh, makes sense that mental health might come into play. Well, I, yeah, I think, I think one way or another, it comes into play for sure. Yeah. The, one of the, one of the symptoms of some of these issues was that he became addicted to heroin. And he was a heroin addict, apparently from a fairly young age uh, until, you know, depending on who you ask, to, until early adulthood. So by some accounts, as early as 13, 12, 13, let's say 13-ish to 22. So he struggled with heroin addiction for many years, apparently, on and off. Probably some years were worse than others. But there are friends who have talked about helping him acquire heroin. 
people that knew that were friends with him that knew about this addiction. Apparently the addiction was pretty severe. And that makes sense to me too, in the sense that I think someone experiencing these mental health problems might be inclined to self-medicate with heroin, specifically if they have issues around anxiety. He actually tells a friend that he's using heroin to deal with his depression. And I don't, you know, using, I mean, I guess that's one way to deal with depression. If you want to blunt all affect, it seems to me that he's probably using heroin more to deal with the OCD and the anxiety issues he's, he's struggling with because heroin would tend to kind of soften or lessen those obsessive thoughts he might be having. I think it's highly probable that when he's a, you know, when he's a young teenager, and he's subjected to all this bullying that he's also starting to have maybe some revenge fantasies. I think this is where it starts. He's thinking about ways to get back at people. And one of the interesting things about his bullying is a lot of the bullying is, is happening from females. So because of his social awkward qualities and because he's walking up to females in the hallway and saying, Hey, I'm, you know, I think you're really cool. Let's hang out. They're, they're pushing back a little bit and they're, they're doing a lot of the bullying. So it's not hard to imagine that this is someone who is now starting to think a little bit about revenge and about, you know, he's having these fantasies about retribution and getting back specifically at women that a lot of the women are, are harming him and they're rejecting him. And he's feeling a great deal of shame and he's probably feeling a great deal of anger and maybe even in some cases rage. And so I think it starts it starts in early, probably in the early teenage years. So why is that relevant? Because heroin would be a way to really attempt to reduce or blunt some of those violent fantasies he might be having. Another way to, to deal with that, by the way, this is something that, that he does successfully, is that he becomes a good student. He's, he's quite smart. He's quite intellectual. And that actually benefits him. So he, he uses his, his intelligence and his intellectual, his ability to really think critically, apparently, in some ways, um, to his advantage. He's a good student. He gets a lot of praise for that. And so that becomes a real plus for him. Um, I'll talk about how that actually might hurt him later uh, in the sense that he uses this over intellectualization, I think is another defense mechanism. So, so very much like heroin, this over intellectualization is a way for him to not only get some praise, but it's a way for him not to deal with the emotions that he's experiencing. So it's a way for him to push out all the shame and the anger and the rage, right? So much like heroin, this over intellectualization as a defense mechanism really becomes a, uh, a way for him to cope with the world. Um, and more so over time, because he's on Dean's lists. He's, he gets, one of his professors says he's the most brilliant student she's ever met, right? He's, he's getting a lot of praise and a lot of accolades for his academic success and for this intellectual quality that he has. Um, so I, th I think that's gonna be, by the way, another interesting part of this story in the sense that in many ways, I think these murders become an intellectual exercise. And, you know, I, I've made a comparison to Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, where I've talked about Raskolnikov and how for Raskolnikov, murder was very much an intellectual exercise as well. And I think yes. there's, oddly enough, you know, we're talking about a crime that's committed 150 years later that's in America, not Russia, but but Dostoevsky certainly understood something about the criminal mind. And there's so many parallels here with Koberger in terms of just this intellectualization and, and kind of dehumanizing the murder from something that involves human beings to something that involves an idea or a principle or an intellectual idea. And so, right, and that, by the way, that's what terrorists do. Terrorists are really outstanding at taking something that, that has a huge human toll and it's, it, it's about injuring and harming and often murdering human beings and then calling it something else, calling it ideology or calling it something 
an idea or something intellectual, right? And I, I think you have that here to some degree. So, so I think that's part of this story too. I just want to point out that people are are saying they they think it's interesting uh, that over and over intellectualizing is a defense mechanism, and people saying also that they realize that he really did sort of think he, uh, here at a Southern Sass, he really did think he was more intelligent than he was or than other people. Yeah. Right. And, and so this, this, this quality of being really smart and intellectual, it keeps cropping up in grad school. One of the students, one of his fellow grad students says he always had to make sure that you knew he was the smartest one in the room. He made a point of arguing his point endlessly until he won and he never left the room without thinking that guy's the smartest or that guy believes he's the smartest one in the room. So I think that's part of this whole over intellectualization with Brian Koberger is that, you know, but it, it becomes reinforced over time. Right. Because he's having he's having a lot of success as a student. He's doing quite well. And he he gets a master's degree and he gets a lot of praise. And then he he's one of the few students from the DeSalle's master program in criminology that gets into a PhD program. So he has so much success doing that. So I think that makes sense that that he sees himself as really smart. In fact, smarter than anyone else in the room. Um, and and you know that could have been it could have been something that really saved him in the end. But if if he was willing to kind of deal with some of those underlying emotions of shame and rejection and abandonment that occurred from his bullying. Um, but I, it, it, it appears that there's, there's no evidence whatsoever that he was going in that direction. And so that's, that's another thing, by the way, that comes out of this, this sense of intellectual superiority is that he, he has, he develops a sense of grandiosity, that he's smarter than everyone, that he's superior. And unfortunately in September, September 23rd of 2022, he gets in an altercation with the supervisor so at this would Washington be, this, State. Okay, this is this is important. Yeah, um, this is really important. So, so now so, everyone take note of this timeline. Yeah, take note that... Go ahead. I just so wanted... It, so, yeah. <laughs> I so just he, wanted to emphasize that. Go ahead. Yeah, the timeline thank you again. for emphasizing Repeat. that. Yeah. So he enters graduate school. He gets to, to Washington State in June. He moves out to Washington in June. And he entered, I think graduate school starts. He probably has some, some orientation meetings, but graduate school starts in August. And literally within the first month of school, he's in an altercation. So the term that Washington State uses is altercation. Obviously, we can't see the specifics of what that's about because School records are quite private, and um, although News Nation was able to obtain the the broad outlines of his dismissal, they were not obviously allowed access to the details of his school record. But in his school record somewhere, you're going to find that on September 23rd, he gets in an altercation with a supervisor, his Professor Schneider. Uh, we don't know what it's about, but when you see the term altercation, that's not good. No, and that's not. If I presume this is some type of verbal altercation, because if there was a physical altercation with the professor, I believe he would have been dismissed immediately. Maybe not. Maybe there would have been a bit of time to evaluate it, given the state of academia these days. There's quite a bit of leeway in terms of dismissing students, which, by the way, makes this all the more remarkable. The fact that he's actually dismissed as a TA. And, and as someone who was in grad school for many years, by the way, you have to really, you have to be way outside. You have to be a, a real outlier to get dismissed as a TA. I mean, you have to engage in some really reprehensible behavior. So, because most grad schools are, they chose you. You've gone through a process of being admitted and vetted and they're choosing you, they're investing in you. They're usually giving you scholarships and they're, they're not in any hurry to get rid of you because of the commitments they've made. They see this as a reciprocal process. They've committed to you. Now they want you to commit back. And the bar isn't really that high. You just have to perform adequately, 
get, you know, attend classes, get decent grades, treat students with fellow students with respect. But here we are, September 23rd. Brian Kohlberger has an altercation, and that's the term they used with the supervisor. Yeah. So here are you, I think you're starting to see this intellectual superiority seep through. It's starting to come out. I don't know what this altercation's about, but if I had to guess, it probably was a difference of opinion or I, I you know, maybe something to do with the way to teach his class, who knows. But clearly Brian Kohlberger felt that he was right and his professor was wrong. And so you have this, you know, you're start I think you're at this point you're really starting to see how this intellectual superiority is starting to man manifest itself in a really negative fashion. And I, and I mean, and again, getting back to the social awkwardness, I mean, any, any grad student knows that it would be really unseemly and uncomfortable to confront, to have an altercation with your supervisor. I right. just, you know, sure. I had some verbal sparring with some supervisors, but it was purely intellectual and it was, it, it, it wasn't me being oppositional or challenging my professors. It was just engaging in discussion where there were some disagreements and it was just an exchange of ideas. Right. But that, that's not what this is. Yes. As, as, as Jean wrote, the term altercation is definitely reserved for out of the ordinary, uncomfortable disagreement. It's, it's un uncomfy. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. Um, I don't want to jump ahead. Uh, and I might be, but we'll talk about, will we go back to a little bit about before the altercation too? Maybe I'm giving a little. Um... Uh, in terms of what's setting the stage for the altercation? Yeah. You mean? Well, here, keep going. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I did jump ahead. Keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, if we look at the timeline, by the way, so let's, let's stay with that for a minute. Let's look at the timeline of his dismissal from Washington state. So he moves to Pullman, Washington on June 25th, 2022. He's starting school in August by September 23rd. He's already in an altercation. So less than a month later on October 21st, and let's keep in mind the timeline of the crime. So the crime here, the crime, as most people will remember, that the crime was committed on November 13th. So this is really important. All of these issues with Washington State, let's keep in mind the timeline leading up to the actual murders on November 13th. Okay. So October 21st, he receives an email from his professor that he had the altercation with talking about deficiencies and ways to correct those deficiencies. Okay. Then on November 2nd, which is literally a, a little bit more than a week after this email from Professor Snyder, on November 2nd, he is called into a meeting with faculty. So now we're talking about multiple faculty members. And so his behavior obviously hasn't improved much. It continues. He's called into a meeting with faculty where they develop an improvement plan. That's on November 2nd. Okay. Okay. That's no, okay. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. Right. So on November 2nd, which is, you know, roughly 10, 11 days prior to his crimes, he's sitting in front of multiple faculty members. They're pointing out his deficiencies. I'm sure Professor Snyder is there. And they're developing an improvement plan. Now, he's been in school for less than a semester. He's had an altercation with right. the supervisor. He's getting complaints, by the way, from fellow students. When, when he's dismissed, when he's finally dismissed on December 19th, which is obviously after the crimes, when he's, when he's fired as a TA, on December 19th, 2022, at a faculty meeting, there's information that's released that multiple female students had complained about his behavior, including one specific student who said that he followed her to the car without consent, without being invited. 
He just followed her. We're not sure why, but she was uncomfortable with it. I guess that's, that's, the, that's the important point. Uncomfortable enough to bring it up. And that is scary. Right. And that was, that would have been post murders. Jeez. So, you're right. I didn't even put that together. You're right. Wow. So I want to. And again, I, I you already said this and you reiterated it, but I want to read it, reiterate it just one more time. This is his first semester in his PhD program, new state, new school. Right. It's, this is a big deal. And it's not like he was getting cocky in his third year or whatever. <laughs> like this is right. Uh, he's a, he's a newbie, like so much for newbie, impression, yeah. so much for impression management. I mean, I guess, I guess he wanted to take the graduate school program by storm and apparently he did. Yeah. But, Someone is asking if being fired as a TA means being kicked out of the program. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. So the is. answer, a couple the answer is it. no, but it's just like one click away from being kicked out. If you're, if you're fired as a TA, you're a bit, you're basically done in a graduate school program simply because number one, you're not going to get the funding you need to support yourself. So that's, that's critical, but also being fired so early in his program and, and some, some TA ships are, connected to tuition reimbursements. So I, and I, it depends on the school, but so presumably my guess is at Washington state that being a TA and getting funding as a TA um, may have been connected to tuition reimbursement. So now it's, it's, it's quite possible that not only did he have to pick up his own tuition for the next semester, but not only would he have to pay his own tuition, but he has to pay all his personal expenses and living expenses, right? Food, everything. So it right. certainly makes it more difficult. But also, and it CC also is goes asking on you're believing he might have even been in, uh, I need to confirm that facility, uh, he might have even been living in facility housing. Yeah, I, right. That's That's true. That would be in jeopardy too. Yeah. So and I, Dr. I think, Von Decay here, I want to acknowledge our gem, Dr. Von Decay, who's also a professor, also saying it's a very big deal. And I want to point out that in particular, I, people realizing a, like a PhD program is often so you can be a college professor. So if you can't be a TA, how can you be a college professor? This this is a very big deal. It's not just being like fired from an aid job. I think this is important to really emphasize. Yeah, it, right. It it really is. It's it's so critical. And this information came out after we last talked about the case. So this is something we haven't discussed before, but it it really throws into question his his future in the program. My guess is so when I have seen graduate students fired as TAs, usually their their life in the program is short-lived. So my guess is he knows that his place in this program is probably in jeopardy. It's probably precarious. And he probably knows he doesn't have long before they dismiss him from the program. So I think that's definitely on the table here. And the reason, I think the reason that's so critical, the reason why this whole timeline at Washington State is really so critical is because I do believe that some of the motive for these crimes was an attempt to even the score with Washington State. In other words, he had a grievance against the department. He had a grievance with Professor Schneider. He wants to settle that grievance. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but and this, this is going to take me back to Raskolnikov from Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. But I think he wants to commit the perfect crime. Yeah, he I agree. That's what you've always said. Crime yeah. As an intellectual exercise to show the program that they were wrong, that he understands criminality better than they do. In fact, not only does he understand it better than they do, but he's going to show them that he can commit the perfect crime and get away with it. And he's going to he's going to have that little bit, that secret that he can harbor when he's in the next faculty meeting or when he's meeting with Professor Snyder, right? He can think, wow, these idiots think they know something about crime, but I committed the perfect crime. I know more than they do. You know, grievance settled, right? That's, that's, 
Just to up, well, I mean, you can even, that has even more oomph when you realize he didn't get the job with the law enforcement, or the internship with the law enforcement. Oh, right. The, right. That was, yeah. That was, another I, I mean, I didn't, of- I didn't know if you were going to get to that. So I don't want to jump ahead. But that right there, what you just said, I want to commit the perfect crime and have this almost this, throw in just some extra notches on his belt of grandiosity. You know, he, I'm sure was also very angry that he was not accepted to the internship because he was a finalist. And when he was in Pennsylvania deciding on Washington, he was a finalist for an internship with police. And that letter he wrote uh, saying why he was a good candidate is he felt he wanted to help them with evidence rural. He, you know, he referred to rural law enforcement agencies and their need for help in uh, you know, with the uh, evidence. So just, I just want to throw another yeah, reason. Yeah. He didn't get, but, he didn't get the internship. So another reason to say, yeah, well, I committed a crime and you guys didn't figure it out. Right. I agree. So that, that the interview with the Pullman police department goes back to April. So that's before he moved to Pullman, but the interview, yes, that's right. He, he applied for an internship with the Pullman police department in April, he conducted an interview and he was rejected for that. So I, I think that plays in too. You have a series of rejections actually. So you have Washington State essentially rejecting him as a graduate student, potentially probably throwing him out of the program. Clearly he's he's been expelled from the program now, but he probably was going to be expelled from the program soon. And I think he knew that. So there was a lot of shame around that the rejection from the Pullman police department that was also being rejected. I think there was some shame there. And I think the last piece to that puzzle was that presumably we haven't been able to confirm this because no information has been released, but it seems that he reached out to at least one of the victims on social media and through a direct message And the victim, we don't know who it is, we speculated, but the victim did not respond. And I guess he was persistent, so he he continued, you know, and again, maybe this goes back to some of the OCD, but he kept going and he kept going and he wanted to hear from the victim. And I think the expectation was that he's some hotshot PhD student in criminology just, you know, down the street. Why isn't she interested in him and she never responded to him. So I think there's some rejection there too. So he's just getting boom, boom, boom. Didn't, didn't get the internship. Now he's at risk of losing his TA job, which means his major part in the program. And uh, he also thought he'd be probably, yeah, womanizing in a new state, being a PhD student. And that's not happening either. Right. And, and this is the first time, this is the first time he's, he's away from home. So this is, that's another part of this puzzle is that at the age of 27, and I guess maybe we can attribute some of this to the pandemic in terms of why he stayed at home until he was 27, but he moves out of the house for the first time at 27 years old. And I, I think we'll talk about this in a bit, but I I think there's definitely some dependency, I guess, maybe codependency would be a more accurate description, but there's some dependency with his mother. I think his mother serves as a buffer. You know, she helps him self-soothe. She helps him cope with some of his emotions that he probably struggles with. I think she really, really assists him in, in dealing with those parts of himself, specifically his emotions and his shame and his feelings of rejection that he doesn't know how to deal with anywhere else. We're getting into his mother now. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Is that where we're going? Because we we do need to cover that. Yeah, let's, so um, I want to, before I get into his mother, I want to, let's continue with this idea of superiority that this is an important piece of this puzzle. And, And so I talked about his weight and how he was bullied for his weight. 
one of his so uh, apparently he goes through a transformation and between his junior and senior year he loses 130 pounds and one of his friends says and this is a quote from his friend his friend says in his junior year he was down to earth and overweight but in his senior year he became thinner than a rail and aggressive right and that's what people are really noticing that he loses this weight a lot of weight and he becomes much more aggressive. He becomes much more arrogant, right? There's a, there's a bit of a transformation here. And I think, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to quote something he wrote in a job application as to why he should get it. When he applied to the Pleasant Valley school district for a part-time security position in 2016 in a job application, he wrote quote, talking about his losing weight, he wrote, and this is a quote, this is proof that I have the required dedication to be successful. So not only is he having academic success, but he sees the weight loss as another feather in his cap. He sees the weight loss as something that makes him successful and special. And as a consequence of that, you have someone who, so let's move this from the intellectual. You have someone that, that now I think perceives himself to be intellectually and physically superior. So this just this doesn't end with the intellectual superiority. You also have someone who has some arrogance around his physical prowess and losing weight and what that means for him. And he sees himself as, in many ways, physically superior as well. So in some sense, you have, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this back to Raskolnikov, that in, in Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov advances this idea of what he calls the great man theory, or what Dostoevsky calls the great man theory. The great man theory is that someone is of intellectual and physical superiority, and they can commit murder and get away with it because of that superiority. Nowadays, I think we'd call it more like narcissism, but, but that's one of the theories advanced in Crime and Punishment by Raskolnikov that fits Brian Kohlberger so well. It fits him to a T, right? This the superiority and with the weight loss, it's the whole person. It's not just his intellect, it's who he is. It's now everything about him, right? And I think that's why he's so devastated when he can't connect to the women at Washington State or he can't connect to some of the women at DeSales, that he just assumes that they're going to automatically be attracted to him. But they're not. Um, exactly. And, right. And so, and so, so that, that becomes an obvious problem. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how far to take this because we haven't been able to prove it, but certainly the, the Papa Roger account would strongly suggest that, that Koberger might be involved in the insult movement. Yeah. Let's, let's, how about this? Let's leave Papa Roger out of it and just okay. talk about the fact that he could yeah. likely be an incel. We don't need Papa Roger. Right. To yeah. But, but that ties him, that would kind of tie him into that. I mean, we have, I have no proof that I have no proof he's an incel, but, but if, if we go with, this I think we have a lot that, of evidence though. We might not have proof, but we have a lot of evidence. We have some evidence. That's true. But I don't know how far I'm going to go with it, but let's just say that that would be consistent with someone who sees himself as intellectually and physically superior. And certainly that movement is based on the idea of male superiority. Um, and again, you know, there, there would be some ties there to, to Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov, I wouldn't call an incel, but just this notion it's that Raskolnikov is very attracted to political movements and, Although some might hesitate to call the incel movement political, it certainly is a political movement in the sense that male superiority would translate into a political stance that favors men. So uh, in positions of power, for example. So, so anyway, we'll just leave it at that. But, um, but I think, I think, so I think those are relevant. Um, where are you going to go next before I bring up something 
Okay, well, I want to I want to jump back to to his mom for a minute. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, cuz we still have this even we even we we went even further back into his life. And yeah, let me and let me try to tie some of that into his mother by the way. I I mean there's there's a lot of psychological theories about why he would feel superior, you know, superior to women and but I mean, but I I think at the most simplistic level it, it appears that his mother was very protective of him, maybe overly protective. You know, she, by the way, she's based on her social media. She seems like a very kind person. Yes. She seems like a very nurturing, kind person. There's nothing about his mother that suggests that she's in any way malicious or mean spirited or that she was overly critical of her son. But I, but I think that that presents an interesting dynamic though, in terms of, Having a mother that fosters a certain amount of dependency and is overly protective and sees you as being superior in some ways, or at least incapable of doing wrong. So you have the 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 female that's at the center of his life is super supportive and overly protective. But then you have this other part of his life where these classmates and other females are bullying him. They're mm -hmm. mean spirited. They're rejecting him. Right. So he's getting a mixed message about women. On the one hand, he loves his mother. He feels very close to his mother. He, in some ways he probably needs his mother, but on the other hand, he can't make any headway or any progress in terms of dating or meeting women or, or developing interactions, you know, developing relationships with the opposite sex. And so right. I think that's a, that's a very confusing message to him. They, they were a buffer for him. They took care of him. They helped right. him. His mother was right. And, and yeah, so he has this, yeah, yeah. He has a superiority complex. You're right. Where he doesn't think he needs his parents. Like he can just, do this on his own, moved to Washington, yet um, needs his parents. Lived well, at home. Mixed feelings lived at about home. It. During, during grad school, lived at home. Yeah, he, during his master's program, he lived at home, right, correct. He lived with his parents. So so certainly, yeah, I, I think his mother was was a really huge buffer in terms of helping him kind of shielding him from the realities of the world. Let's say that. So even though he's getting rejected by a number of women, his mother is soothing him and helping him work through it. And so in that sense, I think that when he goes to graduate school and doesn't have his mother there, that things are quite different and he's getting a much bigger dose of reality. And I think it's really hitting home that perhaps Maybe there is something wrong with him. Maybe he is somewhat inadequate. I think his mother was really able to convey a message to him that he was perfectly fine. And even though these women were rejected him, he just needed to stay with it. He was just a normal guy and smart guy with a lot to offer. And so he, he just needed to stay with it. But that I don't think is what he saw in grad school. A lot of people are bringing up, and maybe we can put a pin in this, but, uh, I have the question too, you know, oftentimes men that have issues with women don't like their mother or have a conflicting relationship with their mother. Some are wondering if he's comparing women to his mother or if he didn't like his mother or how that would play a role. Uh, it, it's probably confusing to him in the sense that he expects women to be like his mother. He wants to, he has an unrealistic expectation of how other women should treat him. They should dote on him. They sh right. They should. They should sacrifice for him. He's again like none of this is helping him develop healthy relationships because his relationship with his mother is not reciprocal. It's completely one dimensional. So I th I think in that sense, his his mother really seems to love him, but but she's creating some problems here. She's creating some confusion because he has this expectation that all women should love him like his mother, and they won't. That's not real. <laughs> Right. In fact, I would I would make an analogy. I, I would I think there's something analogous there to to Brian Laundry and his mother. And we we talked about the the letter that Brian Laundry's mother wrote. And I, I think there's some parallels there. I think it's a very similar type relationship. Hmm. 
Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. Yes. His mother does seem like a very nice person in social media. And it sounds like she was always trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and encourage him and kind of babied him. You know, we, he, he was this older, uh, older, I think than maybe we had thought he would be, but in many ways he had been very babied sort of treated. Let me, let me read some. Yeah. Let me, let me read some, uh, comments that his mother is making on various social media platforms. This is a comment from Reddit and this is June 25th, Saturday, June 25th, 2022. This is shortly after I believe her son left on that day or right around that day. And she says, this is from Marianne Kohlberger. She says, Hello, friends. The quote, hello, friends. Today, my 26-year-old son left for Washington State to begin his doctorate in criminology. We live in Pennsylvania. I probably won't be submitting many designs in the next few days because I will be too busy crying. I will see you all soon. Now, having your son leave and crying and missing your son, that, that would be perfectly normal. But there's something, there's something really fascinating in this comment to me, which is she gets her son's age wrong, right? <laughs> like he actually leaves for school when he's 27 and she says he's 26. <laughs> now, now you may, you may see that as a minor detail, right? Like, okay. So she's, she, she's off by a year, but actually I, I kind of see that as a really salient, part of this comment in the sense that huh. she's minimizing his age, right? She's there's, there's almost, there's some level of denial here in the sense that she's wanting to see him as being younger than he is. And I, I and there might even be a little bit of shame in the sense that, Hey, you know, this is, this isn't exactly like saying my 45 year old just left the nest. I mean, he's, he's not that old. Right. But I mean, and especially with the pandemic, I guess, you know, more young adults were living at home for longer periods of time, but still to leave home at 27, I mean, that's, that's not exactly the norm either. Correct. Right. And, and, and so I think getting his age wrong is almost, it's, it's, it's a little bit of denial about what's going on. Like she wants to see him. She's kind of infantilizing him a little bit. She sure. wants to see him as, as much younger and much more dependent. And, and there might even be a little bit of shame around the fact that he's this age and leaving home for the first time, you know, the baby's leaving the nest. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of, maybe it's changed today, but, 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 you know, when I, when I left for, undergrad at 18, you know, that was, that was me leaving the nest permanently at that point. So, uh, and again, making allowances for the pandemic, maybe that's changed, but this is still a little peculiar and for her not to know. Her I think you, you do have a point and yes, everyone stays at home longer. We agree. I think though, I want to point out that there's a lot of leaving and coming back. And Brian had really never left. That's one thing I want to point out. There was no leaving and coming back. He went to undergraduate and, and his master's program very close to his home. And so um, I just want to throw that out there. Secondly, I do think you have a point because she is uh, in a Reddit community that she'd become close to many people there that were strangers that didn't know her in real life. So she could sort of... Um, slightly changed things. She, she might not have even realized she had done it. It might've been subconscious, but it just might've felt better to her to say 26 than 27. And yes, these are strangers. So they're not going to call her out. And she's looking for comfort from this community and understanding about her son leaving. So to me, it does make sense what you're saying, John, I just want to validate it. Yeah. I, I think that there is some psychology behind that. Right. It, it, it's a peculiar slip. I mean, however you look at it, it's a peculiar slip. I mean, she knows her son's age. 
She knows he's 27. She knows he's going to school. So let me let me read something from the next day. So people responded to that. And then she wrote back and she says, she thanks someone for being kind to her. She says, quote, my son will be in Pullman in the eastern part of the state, quite close to the Idaho border. He knows absolutely no one, no one in caps. He knows absolutely no one. And we have no family there. I worry about him being lonely. So your message made me feel better. That's interesting too, that in some ways in, in that comment, she's saying, I don't know if, I don't know if my son can fend for himself. I don't know if this is someone she's worried about him being lonely, right? She's, there's no one there, right? They, they have no family there. The, the, the implicit assumption is that you have to have family somewhere where you're moving to somehow feel secure. Yeah. She's concerned. She she is legitimately concerned, and I think that she knew to be concerned. And I think we see her concern. She's realizing that her son is leaving the nest for the first time, whether that's normal or not. She um, fibbed a bit about his age, and she is worried about him, probably because she realizes to be she needs to be worried. She probably right. understands very much so why she needs to be worried. Yeah, and she's expressing that. She's, I think she's validating our perception that he's a little socially awkward. I think she knows that. She knows it's going to be hard for him to make friends. She's worried about him being lonely because she's concerned that maybe he can't make friends. So I think she's seen some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah. People are saying she might have hit the wrong key. Yeah, she might have hit the wrong key, but she might have been consciously or subconsciously trying to figure out how to feel better about this. It makes a lot of sense. You know, I've, I could see myself do something like that. If my, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, sure. It could, be as leaving later than anticipated. it could be as simple as that, but let, let's move on. This is from August 17th. Also on a Reddit post. She says, she says in June, my youngest child, who is 27, so she corrects herself. So, you know, a little, a month and a half later, she's actually now acknowledging he's 27 and correcting herself. I, I don't know if she maybe she knew she was anyway. It's it's not that pertinent, but she corrects herself here, so she does show that she knows his age. He relocated to Washington State from our home in Pennsylvania. It was for a wonderful reason to attend Washington State University for his PhD in criminality and, and criminal justice. You would think I would be so happy, and I am, for him, but he is so far away and my heart is aching. I think I'm a little depressed, but I will work through it. I think this is where my lack of inspiration is coming from. So, you know, uh, six weeks later, mid-August, she's She's acknowledging that there's some dependency, I think. You know, I mean, sure. She it, it, She's it absolutely be... acknowledging dependency. I right. see that. But she, yes, right, exactly. And so I, I think that's that's the point of, that's why I wanted to read this, is just to, to show that, and again, missing your child, that's perfectly normal. But getting to the point of depression, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how severe this depression is, but it certainly would indicate that there's some dependency there, I think, as we've been discussing. Right, and it also shows that she probably knows he's lacking some social skills, as some people are pointing out. She knows that her son might struggle, that he's an introvert, or, you know, whatever it is. And so let's continue. This is from November 18th. So here we're getting, this is months into his entering the PhD program. This is Friday, November 18th, 2022. Again, she's writing on a Reddit thread. She says, quote, been kind of blue since my son moved to Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania to Washington to study in a PhD program. I miss him terribly. And I think everything is just a little less colorful without seeing him all the time. But he will be home for nearly a month at Christmas time. Yay. 
uh, again, you know, I, I think it's perfectly normal to miss a child who's going away for the first time. But we're talking about at this point, we're talking about a 28 year old mm -hmm. who she doesn't see as necessarily as very independent or capable of negotiating the world on his own. And clearly this sense of be things being less colorful and being depressed would, would indicate that, that there is some dependency there. And that, and, and as you just said, that, that perhaps she doesn't see him as being capable of taking care of himself without her being present. Right. She knows that she, she probably sees his weaknesses and understands where he struggles and she's worried about him. Exactly. So, so, and, and another thing I should point out too, is that him leaving home for the first time at 27 is not simple. It's obviously not just the choice of the parents that Brian Koberger is choosing to attend universities and programs that are in that area. So even though there's the pandemic and a lot of in the Pennsylvania are, in in the Pennsylvania area in the Pennsylvania right. area, right? Until he goes to Washington State. So for for all of his his undergraduate and graduate education through his master's program, he is making a, a decision to be in the area and to live with his parents. He could have easily applied to schools outside of that area or outside of the radius of their home where where he would have been forced to live on his own or at least live on campus or whatever he chose to do. But, but the reality is that this, this is a mutual, this is a reciprocal decision in the sense that his parents not only want him at home, but he's making that choice too, that he doesn't see himself as thriving outside of the family environment. I mean, it, it could have been as simple as applying to a school in Ohio or somewhere close where he, but he would have been on his own. Yeah. And he would have been on his own at a lot younger age, right? So so I, I think it's important to point out this isn't just a one-way decision. This is this is mutual. They both want to he wants to live with them as well. Yeah. So are there any questions we can catch up on then? Yeah, or? some people are saying, Oh, it's not too uncommon. Guys, I lived at home during college. We're not saying that this is the craziest thing and this is what created Brian Koberger. We're putting pieces together, you know. Right. It's just it's one piece of the puzzle. It's not you have to look at the the dependency, the potentially dependent relationship with the mother, the weight issues, the bullying, right? It's it's all we're just one step at a time. We're just pointing out some things that all are fit, that all fit together. To help us make sense of these, of everything about who Brian Koberger is. Right. Exactly. So let, let's move on. Let's, let's delve a little deeper into his relationship with his mother. There, there is, I think a piece of that relationship that may not seem relevant at first glance, but I think will will help make sense of it. And that is that Marianne Koberger was a huge fan of of Downton Abbey, the show. Who's a Downton Abbey fan here? We're about to talk Downton <laughs> Abbey. <laughs> yeah, we're we're about to get into that show a little bit now. Most of our listeners know that I watch, I, I'm a big consumer of crime culture shows like Dexter and True Detective. And there's a lot of stuff I love that's out there that would be considered kind of pop culture stuff. Um, Downton Abbey is, is not one of those shows. So I'm not familiar with this show, but, but when I read this, when I came across some of these posts, I thought that was completely relevant to understanding Marianne Koberger and her relationship with her, with her son. And we'll explain that in a minute. So, but I think our, I think our viewers are going to have to really help us understand this piece a little bit more yes. and maybe we help us go Downton a little Abbey. deeper with it. So we need our Downton Abbey uh, fans and, and viewers to pay attention now. Okay. So, so on on one of the posts, on one of the Reddit posts, she 
she engages people about the show and she states, should I read this? It's, it's a little yeah. lengthy, but let me, let me read parts of it. So she's, this is a post she wrote on November 24th, 2022. So this is actually after this is post murders. She says, let me start by saying I am forever team borrow. I hope I'm pronouncing that wrong. I think the name is the, way, the, we, we do have the Downton Abbey fans coming out. They say you're missing out. It's time that you <laughs> pay as good of attention as pay attention to this the same way you did Dexter. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Are, is, are there any crimes on Downton Abbey? That would make it more interesting. Are there any, are there any murders? <laughs> on Don Abbey. Does Thomas Bar Barrow commit murders? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, they, so they can sell me. I agree. They they can sell me. I'm 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 open minded about this. Borrow, by the way, borrow. Borrow. Okay. I think there's like five seasons, so it might be a big commitment, but you know, I can be sold. All right. Barrow. Barrow like narrow. Barrow? barrow. I've been saying borrow, and I she just said barrow like narrow. I don't know. Barrow. Barrow. Okay. Okay. You'll have to Barrow. forgive me because I haven't watched the show. So let's say uh, Barrow, like narrow. Okay. Yeah, Barrow, like narrow. She says, I, I am forever Team Barrow. Thomas is hateful in the beginning of the series, which incidentally starts with Thomas recently coming to Downton. Through various dialogue, one can tell that Thomas has not been treated well by family or people in general. He is jaded, self-centered, and driven by the fear of being of being treated poorly and unfairly. Not at all unusual for someone who has experienced his past rejection. Thomas is going to hurt first before anyone has a chance to hurt him. Exclamation point. Hmm. She goes on, quote, coming to Downton gives Thomas the stability he never had. It also gives him the consistency of people who aren't going to accept his poor behavior. Ultimately, the Downton staff becomes the family he never had. They hold his feet to the fire, and over time, all the prickles and stings in Thomas smooth themselves over. Thomas is a character of total redemption. He comes to love the others, and they come to love him. Thomas's vulnerability is evident even in the early episodes where he is being just awful. I was always tuned in to Thomas's vulnerability and hidden goodness. So, well, you just said hidden goodness as somebody else says, Thomas is definitely a villain. Okay. So anyway, um, there's a lot to unpack, I think, from, from this quote in the sense that, you know, when I read this, when I first read this and then thought about it for a minute, I thought this is, in many ways, this is a projection in the sense that this is how she sees her son. That's it, it, when I listen to that, I think this is how she sees her son. This is exactly how she sees her son. So I think I, you know, to use some of her terms, she sees her son as being vulnerable. She sees her son as being quote, someone who has experienced past rejection. She recognizes perhaps that he might be somewhat jaded, self-centered and driven by the fear of being treated poorly, unfairly recognizing his past bullying. Right. There, the, I mean, when you and I talked to people about the show or when I did, there was not a single person who was team borrow. People did not like this character. And so it's really, I think it's, it's really fascinating that his mother loves this character and sees this, this is her favorite character on the show. And he's basically a villain who harms people apparently, but she also recognizes his vulnerability and his past rejection. And I mean, I don't know, that's almost precisely what we've been discussing about her son. Right. The rejection, the series of rejections potentially leads to the murders or contributes to the murders and the vulnerability that her son feels is something that he, he dislikes immensely. So this this vulnerability idea is fascinating in the sense that I think I think it goes beyond vulnerability a little bit, but it's 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 vulnerability, it's insecurity, it's inadequacy, it's all the things that that 
I think the social awkwardness and the bullying from his childhood kind of created. And violence, by the way, is a way to compensate or overcompensate for that sense of inadequacy. Violence is a way to show that you're powerful and you're in control and you're not vulnerable. You're strong, right? And so we there's different versions of Koberger here in the sense that we have a Koberger who his mother sees as being very vulnerable. And then we have a Koberger that's presenting himself in graduate school as someone who's intellectually and physically superior. And so I think it's it's those different parts of Brian Koberger that really drive this narrative. That if if somehow the vulnerable Koberger was at the forefront or something that Brian Koberger was more aware of, I don't think he would have had these murders. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what else do you want to cover, Ali? I like, thank you so much for your support. And I actually like this comment. I think it's a great comment uh, question to talk okay. about tonight because okay. John and I were actually discussing what it is about this case. Um, Ali B from Tennessee says, I feel like every channel on YouTube throws out different theories on this case, which is great. But do you feel like there is typically this much curiosity prior to murder trials? Or I, I think what you're saying is this much curiosity in a case. Um, I think that's a great question. I don't know if you want to save that for later, John, or talk about it now. But it is something we were talking I, about. Right I, I, I think the level of curiosity is unusual. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that this case began with what, what the FBI calls an unsub. An unsub is an unknown subject. So this case be, began as a mystery to be solved. It began with out knowing who did it. We, we know it was a horrendous crime, which I think created a lot of interest. But it, but it offered to the public or to, to web detectives internet detectives, it offered a chance to solve the case, to solve the crime. And I think that draws people in quite naturally. So the fact that there was a suspect that wasn't identified or known, I think that that sparked a huge amount of interest in addition to the fact that the, the crimes were brutal, just the brutality of the crimes. I think it, it probably would have provoked less interest if, if let's, let's say it was Kohlberger, if, if Kohlberger had used a gun. If he had walked in, just massacred people in the house with a gun and left, it probably would have been a little less interesting. I mean, I think it would have still had interest, but the fact that he used a knife, and a knife in some ways is so personal and so intimate that and, and so so chilling and horrific and grisly that I think that made it all the more interesting. And that gets would get to my next point, which is that for many of us, this type of crime is a literal nightmare. This is like Freddy Krueger leaving your dreams and showing up by the side of your bed at four in the morning. Or Mike Myers from Halloween or any of these mythical figures, Hannibal Lecter, take your pick. Or if you want to go back, you could go, you, I could even say, this is like, you know, even if, if you go back to like Jules Verne, like old stuff from, you know, the monster at the bottom of the sea. It comes out of nowhere and swallows you whole. There's something really primitive about this type of killing. There's something primal and primordial. It, it, it's, it's, I think, so you have that. You have this quality, like this very kind of animalistic, primitive quality to these murders that, that really provokes something in us, that makes us really afraid, right? It, it creates a lot of fear and it creates a lot of uncertainty. And, insecurity and but but again like i think all of that is to say that that that's why by the way monsters haunt our nightmares because we don't understand them very well and they show up when we least expect them to show up and i think that's what you have here nobody wants to be nobody wants to to, to wake up at 4 a.m in a complete 
deep sleep with somebody with a massive knife wielding a massive knife leaning over their bed, right? That is that is something that will keep most of us awake at night. As somebody said, it's a real life scream movie. Right, exactly. And a so a real I, life I, horror movie. That should never happen to anyone, especially for young college students. Yeah, this is it's a real life horror movie. It's it's just brutal. You don't know, we don't know it initially we didn't know who did it. You've got I think all of those elements are combining to really create an unusual level of interest and curiosity. And yes, I agree with, I agree with Ali B, you know, that it, it that they're, you know, we're, we, <laughs> we've, we've listened to a lot of these channels and their theories and yeah, there's so many theories out there. Um, and it's, it's maddening. And so I, you know, I, and, and we're, we're proposing theories as well. And there's, there's no one, you know, I'm not going to argue that our theories are right or wrong. I mean, it's just, um, it's, these are, these are theories as well. I mean, hopefully, hopefully we're sticking close to the evidence and providing, you know, elucidating, um, the criminal mind here a little bit, but people can make their own decisions about that. I also want to point out Paige Willow stated something that we talk a lot about here on our channel that they wanted to make sense. We want to, we all want to make sense of the unthinkable. And uh, I like what Yerni says too. And these girls did everything right. Correct. They had a dog. There was a male in the house. They stayed together. Everything we were told to do. Yeah. It did not save them. I think sometimes also one reason I think victim blaming happens in cases is part of the wanting to make sense of the unthinkable. If we can blame something for for whatever happened, then we feel safer. It's not so much that we're wanting to blame the victim as much as we're trying to feel safer. And 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 what you just said, yes, they did everything right. Like we can't even we try to blame someone and we can't. This is you know, there's nothing anyone could have done. Well, and again, that's that's what makes it again. That's part of the appeal. You can do everything right and still get harmed. That's what makes, again, that's what makes this a literal nightmare in the sense that every pop cultural show that depicts these types of murders, and I mean like mythological, again, mythological figures like Dexter or Hannibal Lecter or Freddy Krueger, right? These are, these are, these are all part of our, our psyche to some degree, but they're not real. We see them as unrealistic, but this is real. And this is exactly what we don't want to see happen to us or our loved ones or our family. And we don't, we, we don't want to see it happen to strangers. Right. It shatters our assumptions about the world. If our, our basic assumptions about the world are that the world is fair and safe and just this type of crime really upends that. And it really shatters that assumption and it really creates a rupture at the center of the universe that we want to repair. Yeah. And so here we are trying to repair it, right? That's why, that's why so many people are talking about this crime because we all want, we all want the reparation. We all want justice to some degree. We all want to put the universe back together. I'm looking at my notes. There were some good questions, but we've been going for a while. What would you like to conclude with? There were some great questions tonight, everyone. And so, and I've written them down here and I'm looking at them. Um, uh, some of them were, came with a, with a generous super chat. So we might have to get to these next week or perhaps okay. um, just, we have, we have a babysitter. So we don't, we, we could stay here all night with all of you, <laughs> but uh, and and for all those mothers worried, I already I joke all the time that I'm going to move into his dorm room with him. Dorm room, so don't worry. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I'll uh, it, it, I can't imagine that feeling of empty nesting, empty nest. All right, um, where would you like to end? Um, let me just let me reiterate. Let me reiterate a couple of. of We've talked about a couple of these. I haven't talked about one of them, but I, I think there's three primary reasons for the violence here. 
One of them was that I talked about that he wants to even the score with his department. And by the way, so one thing I didn't mention is that Brian Koberger's birthday is November 21st, 1994. So November 21st is literally a week, roughly a week after he commits the murders. So I think that's another element in the sense that he's turning 28, which means that he's, you know, I guess you get a pass. You probably get a pass on being a real adult until you're like 25, 26, but 28, you know, you're, there's probably some expectations. You're going to do something with your life. And he's on the cusp of, of he's lost. He's been fired as a TA. I mean, he, he doesn't know that on November on his birthday or when he commits the crimes, but he has a pretty good sense that things aren't going well. So his birthday's coming up. That's another element. His birthday's coming up. He's going to be 28. And I think he's realizing that all this investment he made in criminology could be coming to an end. That he might be looking at changing careers or having to reverse course. And so there's, there's this whole set of expectations, I think, that are being upended. In addition to the fact that He's getting in altercations with the supervisor. So, you know, I mentioned this as kind of even, trying to even the score with his program. I think it's more than that. I think there's there's a bit of an existential crisis here in the sense that he may have to find a completely different career. He may have to reverse course completely and start all over again. He's, you know, he's getting close to 30. He's got to do something with his life. He knows this. He can't, I guess he could live at home forever but he probably doesn't want to, or maybe he does. I don't know. But anyway, I think there's a little pressure from his birthday coming up too. So it's interesting that, that this crime occurs a week before his birthday. So let me throw that in. I think that's another possible motive. You think that's another possible motive. Um, so you have this, you have this getting even or settling the score with his department. I mentioned that um, another reason I think for the violence is you have this, Transform it. You have this attempt to cope with the sense of inadequacy and the sense of insecurity and to kind of transform it into to, to its opposite, which is the sense of superiority or power. And violence is violence is a very efficient way of doing that. It's a very efficient way of feeling special or feeling powerful when you don't in general feel that way, which by the way, research on school shooters, especially research by Peter Langman has shown consistently that I've made analogies to Koger, you know, school shooters in Koberger. I think there's, there's quite a bit in common there, but, but so that's, that was another reason. There's, there's a third reason here. And that is, I think that violence often can be a distraction and, um, I think Koberger needs a distraction. His his world is coming unraveled. And he's feeling a lot of shame. He's feel, This is someone who's not good about processing emotions. So typically when you struggle to deal with the emotions that he would be experiencing, the shame, the rejection, the anger, all these interior emotions that Koberger was probably experiencing that he struggles with, you look for in those types of instances, often violence can be one of the best distractions in the sense that you are literally transferring the focus of what's going on in your life from something internal to something external. And so the whole this this whole system or this whole plan of stalking and planning and getting the not like all of this becomes a really big distraction from the realities of his life which are, again, that his life is coming unglued, that he's going to probably get you know, fired as a TA and he's probably going to leave the program, that he's been rejected apparently by several women or potentially by several women. He didn't get the internship. And this, this is somebody who was a star in his previous program, right? This is one of his, his professors, Michelle Bolger, says he was the most brilliant student she'd ever had. Right? This is someone who went from being a star to now watching his life unravel within six months. Yeah. In fact, so I think violence is, is often, you know, can often be, a, if you want to change 
the dynamic of what's going on in your life, violence is one hell of a way of doing that. It's one way of really quickly changing, changing the, uh, changing the score. It's a way of changing the the dynamic in your life from something that is forcing you to deal with it and forcing you to really confront certain emotions to creating a massive distraction that takes all your time and energy of focus away from what's really going on. Yeah. I have to, <laughs> uh, you, it looked like, uh, you had a bit of a stalker there yourself. So I'm laughing because <laughs> people were, I didn't mean to be giggling, but people were wondering if we were in a horror movie ourselves, we are working on a little project, everyone. So we were, we, we are filming today's live show. We'll let you know later <laughs> for those wondering who Dr. Babe's stalker was. And now you look frozen. So hopefully he is safe. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just reviewing my notes to see if we've, of course, there's, there's a lot we didn't cover, but um, we can't get to everything, unfortunately, in, in the time frame we have. So, yes. Right. But, it, but thank you. Thank you. There's always next week. We do need to head. Thank you to those that, uh, have liked this, uh, video. I, JM, I want to reach, he, they say, I'm usually too lazy to hit that like button, LOL, but I did it. That's like the that's, biggest compliment. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you, JM. You just made, made my day with, with our house flooding and tablets <laughs> breaking and our podcast apparently evaporating. And right your stalker our behind eyes. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't um that that you had the courage to hit the like button means a lot to us. Thank you for yes. And I, I by the way, am, am one of the people that's really lazy about hitting the like button too. So I can totally relate. I I, I need to find a little more courage to hit the like button too yeah. for other and channels. A, yes, and a special thank you to our moderators. We do have the best moderators, and I told them I was a bit worried. This is such a high profile case and it's a, it's a crime that we uh, stopped covering for a couple months, always planning to jump back on. But I said to our moderators, Hey, can you just be a little bit, um, you know, extra tonight, just make sure everything goes okay. And they've done a wonderful job even catching your mic issue. And I didn't. So thank you to our moderators and again, to, to Julie Holden. And thank you for the person, someone paid for Julie Holden's pillow at the Bellagio. So thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't, so. I didn't even know you could, can you do that? Can you purchase a pillow? For it's someone? purchased now. We just, she's got okay. an extra pillow now. Uh, for those that don't know, Dr. John, uh, Dr. Babe made a, I think it was a joke, but it's sort of becoming a reality now that uh, when we hit 144,000, we're going to have a pool party at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. <laughs> so, yeah. so thanks for your yeah. subscription. Too. Gotta, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I know that um, Julie's definitely going to have her pillows. So, uh, right. So yeah. So the joke happen. is for those who don't know the Daybell case that um, they wanted to. It's from the Book of Revelation that in the Book of Revelation the goal is to gather 144,000 true believers and survive the apocalypse and then head up to the New Jerusalem. So that's what. That's what Lori and Chad Daybell believe. They were gathering the 144, but we're we want to gather the 144,000 too. But we want instead of heading up to the New Jerusalem, we want to head to the Bellagio. So <laughs> I, I think hear Bellagio, Rick pain too. The Bellagio to would be a lot more exciting than the New Jerusalem. I mean, maybe not as um, maybe not as enlightened, but you know, certainly more fun. Yes. Anyway, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, thank you for sticking with us and um, for your for your support. We'll see you at the Bellagio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't we're, I don't think we're close. We'll invite to that, the stalker but... behind you too. Oh, okay. We'll, uh, yeah. We'll, invite, we'll, we'll have appearances from everyone. So, all right. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Justice for for someone said justice for JG Tylee. Tammy, Joe, and Charles. Thank you, Justice Jane. Lori Vallow Daybell sentencing is on the 31st. And Justice, let's end with that for Zanna, Ethan, Maddie, and Kaylee. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a Absolutely. good night. Thank you, guys. Good night.